you can't be an architect to lead um, a nuclear project, you've got to become a responsible engineer. Episode 79. Hello and welcome. My name is Ryan Willard and I am the host of the Business of Architecture UK. And this week I'm up in Accrington, which is actually near Blackburn, uh, not too far away from Manchester, up north, absolute beautiful part of the country. And I had the good fortune to visit Jason Boyle in his beautiful home there. Now, Jason is a architect. He's a the founder of My Mentor Expert. He's the RBA ambassador for infrastructure, and he's actually leading the architecture on one of Sellafield's three mega projects. Um, so he's had a distinguished co- career in energy and infrastructure projects. Um, in 2017, Jason became the youngest fellow of the RBA, and in 2018, Um, was received a fellowship from the Royal Society of Arts and is now an ambassador for architecture in the civil and engineering sectors. He's also been a pioneer of building information modelling to nuclear and energy infrastructure projects. And as I said before, he's the founder of uh, MyMentor.Export, which is a personalised mentoring uh, program to unlock the potential for architects in any stage of their career. So in this episode, um, Jason and I discuss Jason's career in infrastructure and the pathways that are available for other architects who wish to pursue such a career. And we discuss the power of mentoring both in your career and in your business. So sit back, relax and enjoy Jason Boyle. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Jason, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. We're here in uh, your home in Accrington. Yes. Um, beautiful rolling hills outside. Um, absolute pleasure to be in this part of the world. And you've had a really fascinating career. Uh, you've done a lot of work in infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, and you're also a mentor to lots of young aspiring architects and other architects in in the profession who are dealing with various work related growth. That's right, um, absolutely. Things, and yes, yeah, so it's an absolute pleasure. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to, to be on your podcast. I've listened to many of the episodes. They're great. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you so much. Well, it's, ni- it's always nice to be in, in the home of somebody, and you've got a very beautiful home here, and I'm enjoying your, uh, your purple resin floor. Um, <laughs> so tell me, how, how, what is your role within infrastructure? Because it's it's un- you're the first architect I've met who's, yeah. who's working so deeply in infrastructure. So start me off there about how your career kind of began yeah. and blossomed in, into that direction. Well, I was actually in a private practice in Manchester um, for around about 10, 11 years. And um, to be honest, the uh, recession hit. Um, but I was, I was thinking about my direction of where I wanted to, um, go. So it it was, um, the recession kind of forced me to make a real decision about my kind of future. And I had this opportunity to, um, go and work in nuclear, um, Mm. which is, um, an industry I think that most architects wouldn't consider. And I, uh, there was a great guy who, um, I was interviewed by a, a company um, which are 100% funded by the taxpayer who are looking after um, making the 
we're safe, so we're high hazard reduction. So I met I met Paul, who is no longer with us now, but um, he kind of communicated to me what what architects do in nuclear and how we play a, a part in in infrastructure, uh, civil infrastructure. And he kind of persuaded me to, um, you know, really give it a try to see if it would be something that would be a good fit for me. And that's now, that's that career is kind of coming up to 11 years, uh, 11 years in nuclear. And I'm very happy actually um, being in nuclear. Um, well, what is the role that you have? What, what, yeah. what, what, what's the, what makes a role within nuclear, within this kind of energy infrastructure unique? For an architect, what kind of work are you doing? Yeah, I mean, like I've, I think I hinted in the last question, it's uh, it's about high hazard reduction. So mm. we're we're trying to um, deal with the the waste and the legacy from the nineteen fifties, um, where there was a lot of experimentation with um, with uh, nuclear material, and we have a legacy that we have to deal with. And so the buildings we're building are, are, are kind of all um, unique and challenging. Um, because if you imagine you're taking um, nuclear material, uh, which is being stored safely, and we're trying to obviously look at the long-term storage. So until we build a long-term storage facility, which um, is needed for 10,000 years, mm. we need to build intermediate stores. But we have to deal with different material in different ways. So every building is designed to um, safely uh, package that um, waste up and um, so it can be stored until the deep storage facility is done so there's there's around about 200 nuclear buildings uh, thousands buildings um, support buildings to it as well so it's um, the size of like um, wow and how many other architects are there within the company there's around six right so we're very so very niche. small team it's pretty niche um, we do use a lot of consultants uh, from big organizations um, who come and help us and support us because um, um, we, so we have quite a small um, capability, but that capability, um, including myself, um, we lead um, the design of these facilities or act as intelligent customer mm. from the site license because you know, every nuclear site has to have a site license uh, to operate. Um, and that's um, that's where... I've um, gone with my career, but in order to be running a sort of project, you can't just be an architect. So you can't be an architect to lead um, a nuclear project. You've got to become a responsible engineer. Right. And what that essentially means is you do another two years training and to understand um, looking after the civil, structural and architectural. So it doesn't mean you have to be a structural engineer. It doesn't mean you have to be a civil engineer. It means you have to understand how you interact with them engineers and understand the standards and legislation in order to discharge your duties. So essentially, that's what it is. So it's like a nine-year process to to in, a, in order to design a nuclear facility. It's heavily regulated, right? Um, and that's why these buildings and facilities do take a long time to design, and they're very specialized. So, and is this a kind of a, a very unique skill set that you could take? elsewhere or it could be transposed into a different types of sectors or is it something that is like it's it's a very kind of focused no part. i think i think the principles so the principles um apply to very complex large buildings mm. so we have a so we have a process within um nuclear design where we probably what you don't do in when you're designing normal buildings is we, we look at um um, flow diagrams of so people flow and material flow so looking at um, lots of and um, working with a process team so the process engineers really understand where things are going and where things are moving from so we go back to real first principles right before we even design a building and so we understand them them sort of um, interactions you've got to understand mechanical flow diagrams and how the machines will work and you've got to take all that information and then pull it into something that will house and enable that process mm. you see um so that's how it's probably different so the print but the principles of designing complex buildings can be used to design any other complex building right you know um 
you could even use it in a hospital, for example, a really big hospital. How does it work in terms of who your client is or how you interface with the client? I suppose you, you are employed directly by, so yeah. they're the ones. How do, how do things like briefs get developed and you're, you're working out what the client wants or who is it that you're reporting to? Yeah, it starts, I think it starts with a problem. So we have um, everything is pretty much in a stream. So one building may be supporting the activities of another building. So you will have a problem you've got to resolve. And within, so we have, um, we have government um, organizations like this, and which act as our client. And then above that's the government. And they will know what they need to do per, per year. And that they'll, they have, they've got a plan. And so they only different buildings coming on stream at different times. Mm. So there's a, there's a whole program of work and they will develop a brief with us. So right. alongside us, we will develop a business case, which goes to government. Right. And, and we then get approval um, once it's been vetted and gone through its governance. And then we'll come back with a project and a budget. And is it a, is it the kind of role that there is a lot of, um, a lot of people wanting to get into or... If young architects are kind of intrigued it's, by yeah, it, it's, yeah, I mean, what's the route? What's I think the path? That, that's that's the that's the real problem. I think a lot of people don't see nuclear buildings. They see they probably think of concrete bunkers. Yeah, um, they don't see you think of the actual. And the yeah, kind of... and 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 you know, obviously for for reasons um, that are obvious to most people, you know, these things are contained within things that look like boxes, you know, they look very um, uh, utilitarian, mm. but inside there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of, a lot going on. So it just depends if um, you're that type of architect who wants something, you know, to look fantastic externally, or you're interested in solving big problems. But I think the, the problems we're solving are really complex, difficult problems. Mm. And that is the challenge for me and how you want that to work safely um, and and deal with um you know material that's um that's high hazard as we all know mm. um that is the challenge and that's what excites me and i think there's probably if architects young architects knew that that was a, a challenge there would be a degree of them that would be interested in, mm. in in designing nuclear facilities definitely and what kind of um you, you kind of touched upon it a little bit uh, the sort of legislation and the planning regulations how does the yeah. how does it operate with, with planning and do you have to deal with all sorts of uh, various groups and is there lots of controversy around it or do you, um, do you ever come across that kind of yeah we 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 have to um we have to get planning so uh, like everyone else public consultation yeah and... we've got to do consultation we've got to do planning we meet with the local um authority there um we can't always show exactly what's um what the building's doing mm. but we can you know make them aware that this is this is what it's going to look like this is the impact we do all of the environmental assessments that everyone else does so we're not a special case at all. Um, we, you know, we comply because um, we have to and we should. Um, everything is done to regulations, building regulations as well. Um, and it's, um, so, you, so it's still the same, the, so the, the things you would do outside of nuclear, you would still do inside of nuclear. Mm. Um, it's just, um, I don't know, it's just, you just can't reveal the, the internal workings of the facility you know for obvious reasons yeah there's a lot of sort of secrecy involved in those types yeah, of things or yeah. just for say uh, yeah for national security national really. security yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting i used to work at um and i spent a lot of time doing airport infrastructure and working on terminals and obviously one of the things there that was interesting was that you had a very multi-headed client a very multi-headed right. corporate client um and as a design process we had to have a very uh, like a form of optioneering we used to call it where you would kind of have a, a sort of matrix of solutions that could right. be played against other solutions and i can imagine that that, that something of complex of such complexity as this would have a similar yeah. sort of process or a similar sort of engineering language to the way that you're producing solutions to absolutely and we have we have a process where by at every stage um, we go through um, this gated process. Mm. So we go, we take, we take things through a concept design 
that then get that gets approved the business case gets approved then we take things through a preliminary design we uh, vet that interrogate it um, and nowadays it's using um, the computer technology using BIM um, and then we and before it goes into detailed design it'll be vetted again and it and that's for not just architecture it's for the whole of the disciplines and right. um, so there's a very thorough process before anything actually gets built what, um, what sort of time scales are we looking at for yeah well, on average you're looking at a 10 year 10 year process for a building and my last one was completed in seven years um on time and on budget um but it's it's usually around about 10 years yeah and what would you what would your advice be to somebody who was interested in in designing these kinds of infrastructure projects or getting into specifically yeah. into into nuclear i think um you, you can, there's lots of um, the big consultants out there who do nuclear work. Um, if you're interested in big complex buildings, industrial buildings, um, um, laboratories, that sort of thing, that would be, that would look good on your CV to start developing an interest in getting into nuclear. But we, we have all the major design consultants um, have a nuclear arm to them. Right, you know, um, and that would be a good way of getting into um, work because we tend to we tend to keep um, um, the architecture in our company very small. But it's not to say there's not room for for more people. Mm. Um, but I'm just if if I was giving advice to people, I would say come in through the consultancy side. Right, that would be a good start. Are there other architecture firms, external architecture firms, that do this kind of work? I remember. Used to do a lot of work yes. with, with nuclear. Yeah. But they're not just they're not pure architects. They multidisciplinary. So it tends to be the multidisciplinary. The big companies. sort of engineering contracting yeah. firms that yeah have. that do that. Yeah. And what has been your innovations? I understand you've kind of been very uh, kind of a forerunner for implementing BIM technology into these types of projects. Yeah. Um, so back in two thousand and eleven, I became a responsible engineer, um, and then I was given. Um, a project to do straight away that needed to be done, um, which was um, facility, which um, we had a challenge because the challenge was, this is back in 2011, remember, we had to deliver this project in seven years instead of 10. So we had to shave three years off a 10-year build program. So the project manager at the time said, you know, can everyone think of a way that we could do this? What, what are our options? So I was like looking around at the government white paper and Paul Morell and um, this, um, you know, his idea of using digital technology to um, streamline processes and, and BIM, BIM methodologies. And we were very naive at that time and there was not too many people kind of trained up, but I did a lot of reading um, and I put it basically to the project team, can we, why don't we use BIM and to, to design this building, do it fully digital. Mm. And so I had to persuade, they're already signed up with contracts to deliver it in a different way, but I pushed and pushed and pushed and the project manager, luckily I persuaded the project manager, I said, and he could, no one else on the team could think of it any other better ways. So that's the way we went and we went and, um, it got into, um, after we built a successful team and did some training in house, it really got us through our gates, gated process really quickly. We were delivering things um, by learning constantly, looking and evaluating things, and um, bringing a good team of people in. Mm. We've all gone off now and done really good other projects. And we, we, you know, like a crane, you, you know, if you're doing craneage on a nuclear site, that can take a long, long time to persuade the crane committees that it's, set, it's safe. But if you're using digital technology and BIM and it's an animation sequence, they're sold. So I did that. I did a lot of lecturing, wrote a, quite a lot of articles and just got ho wholly involved in the BIM um, side of things with the government. Mm. And um, then... Um, we landed the project and finished it on time and we finished it on budget, which is quite a rare thing within nuclear. Um, so that is, that's probably one reason why I got my fellowship. Right. Yeah. With the RIBA. And so can you talk a little bit about that? What, what, 
When did you get your fellowship? So I got that in November 2017. And you're quite young to receive. Yeah, I think I was 44 at the time, uh, 45, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it was a bit of a surprise to me. Um, but I think it was the... Because it was a project of national significance. Yeah. Um, it was pulling the whole nuclear industry into into BIM, the BIM world, mm. and the lecturing and the um, the writing of articles to promote the use of using this technology. And the government were wanting companies um, to use this technology, the private sector in particular. Um, so I think it was that that led to me getting um, the fellowship. It's having a real impact on the UK. Mm. Um, and yeah. And I got my fellowship and then I've decided what I wanted to do next, which is mentoring. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that and how, what kind of professionals you're mentoring um, and why, what kind of yes. inspired you to do that? So the RIBA um, actually said to me, what do you want to use your, um, um, they gave me this title in the letter, ambassador for civil infrastructure. Yeah. And they said to me, what do you want to do? How can we help you? And I said, well, what I really want to do is mentor people to help younger architects and, and give them that support um, to um, become either qualified architects or help them achieve what they want to achieve. So I set up a, a company called My Mentor Dot Expert, And this is outside of work. It's got nothing to do with work. It's... Um, I don't actually get paid for it, mm. so I do it just because of um, I feel I've, I'm giving back to to sort of architecture. So I took on, I put an ad, uh, advert on LinkedIn. Um, I've got twenty five thousand followers now on LinkedIn, um, and I got a big response of about three hundred people. Lots of young architects saying, "How uh, can you help me?" You know, so I, I whittled it down to about six people, and I took. I didn't really want to take on six people. Six people is a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of time to give um, so I took on six people and I set up a mentoring group and basically gave them a time every month where I would men mentor them um, most were all, they all spread all over the country um, and that's that's kind of what I've been doing for the well I did that for a year and it's grown so I've got more people adding to the group um, so what's what is a mentor for you for me I think it's the mentoring approach I do take is holistic mentoring. Right. So it's not about how I can teach you to be a better architect because I don't profess that I'm a great architect. Yeah. I think it's more about that mindset and about the um, the Covey sort of principles, Stephen Covey. Um, so about, seven habits type of... Yeah, seven habits of success. And these, these little changes that you can make to your day and having um, just even getting up on the morning and making your bed and just these routine habits that can make you get into the right mindset within your work and your uh, personal life. Mm. And by, I've lived that most of my life without knowing it. It's only when you start reading these books, you're thinking, well, this is what I've done. Yeah. And then, um, and being able to like the actual principle of listening, most people don't know how to listen. So, I teach these principles, which I've been working on for quite a number of years, and help um, people discover themselves mm. and, and give them tips and question them. And um, so you could say it's a little bit like counseling, but I would not say it is counseling. It's more um, helping them to equip themselves and realize their potential. Mm. Uh, what, what do you find a lot of architects or younger architects or the people that you're mentoring are, are there any kind of similarities in the term in the in the sorts of obstacles that they face like either personally or like um internally yeah yeah i think we come from a culture where we've been at university where we've done long hours we've um done all-nighters and then we get into the office and it's long hours and it's uh we're we're pretty much um we've got that passion but it's kicked out of us a lot of a lot of times and um, through um, this culture that we have. And for me, it's about having that work life balance mm -hmm. because you're really if you, you know, you can you can work for so you can only really be productive for so many hours in a day. And when you get beyond a certain length of time in a day, you just um, 
your production just drops right off and I don't see the point of, 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 of doing that and I think the culture's all wrong if you look at other countries um, sort of um, Sweden Denmark you know they don't do that and they're still very successful mm. um, so it's it's that getting thinking about how you can be productive at work not having to stay longer hours and then you free up more time in your personal life mm. and you can have you can do other things. Work just doesn't become the be all and end all of life. Mm. And I think uh, a lot of architects, um, architecture is just everything. And that, it, to me, is wrong. You know, it really is wrong. And that's why, you know, there's a lot of, I would say, architects who drink too much <laughs> yeah. to cope with that. And it kind yeah. of just, it starts putting things off kilter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, so, in terms of being unproductive, how, what are the sort of things that you can point to an individual for them to become aware that they're being unproductive? Because sometimes it feels like by being busy, it feels like you're doing something and yet you know you're not. And then all of a sudden the day's disappeared. What are the yeah. sorts of things that you help people like get control of their productivity or kind of start reducing their hours down? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um this, this, this is, it, it's a, it does take quite a bit of time for people to realize that because a lot of people will say, oh, no, I, you know, I do them as because my employers require me of that. But then I kind of, I ask some very simple questions. I go, are you happy at work? Do mm. you feel that you're um, actually, the work that you're actually doing is valued? I'll say, um, do you feel that you, uh, are allowed to take an hour at lunch to have a lunch break and you'd be interested just them three questions if they say no I don't feel like I can have a break at work or you know no I don't feel like I'm my I'm being valued mm. then it's it, they're, they're quite leading questions and then you find you actually find that they are working long hours but they're not they're not getting stuff done they're not actually being successful um, you know, and I, and I, you know, I've, I'm mentoring, I'm mentoring two people. At, mm. So we're talk we're talking not just, um, you know, I would say the lesser, lesser known practices, it's the top practices, yeah. even in the top practices, you are really high performing places, yeah, high performing places, you know, people still need that help. Mm. And I think the way I see it is you can have a mentor in your, in your work. But that mentor really will only be interested in you being productive at work. Yeah. So my um, thing of the reason why I set up is to help people in a holistic sense to look at your whole work-life balance. Because if you are happy outside of work, you, you, the chances are you're going to be much more happier in work. Mm. You're going to have that better perspective on life. Um, and that's that's the sort of thing I really want to tell people because... I can where I work. I have that balance where I work. I do. I just do the hours that I need to to do, and I feel so much. I can get so much more done outside of my work life. And do you think this is something that employers can be taking responsibility for, as yeah. well? In terms of, and what what sorts of things would you advise uh, people who are running a team or running a practice to encourage or help facilitate their you know, their, their people to have work-life balance, healthy work-life Yeah, balance. I'd say if you, you don't have a happy um, a practice and a happy team of people um, and you don't think about them soft issues that they, people would call it, mm. you are really going to lose staff and you should be looking at your staff uh, retention. You know, are you um, losing good people quite often? Um, and are the people um, who are working for you enabling you to make that profit? Because I think architects should be profitable. Yeah. Um, and I have a thing whereby I've always said this where I work, I don't ever have a meeting longer than an hour. And in fact, I always try and get it down to 45 minutes because otherwise it becomes a workshop or a talking shop. So I think there's there's principles that you can use in, in, um, in the office whereby, say if you... You set up a two-hour meeting, but you cut it down to an hour, and you or you stood up in the meeting, so people really weren't tempted to just, you know, <laughs> to get to the point. Yeah. Then you could give that hour back to them to have a good lunch break and go yeah. encourage them to go for a walk or do some yoga or, or something, 
they would be happy at work. They're more likely to do better work for you. Mm. So it's just thinking about things like that. I think people easily in practices can get into very, um, um, this culture of meetings for meetings sake, sometimes of them going on too long. I, th- I, th- I believe in sort of fast bursts of energy yeah. and then some downtime. Yeah. Um, fast bursts of energy, you know, intensive work and then a release not this sort of factory culture where you're just in there going to the you know running down the clock mm. um that's the that's that's my sort of it's, my personal view it is it's interesting i've spoken to a lot of um like high performance mentors um and they talk about this art of focus and concentration and yeah. that a lot of people in our, i'm guilty of been doing this when you just kind of just sit in front of the computer for like hours mm. on end and you just sort of like and actually, you, you 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 do you drop off you drop off in productivity yeah. and energy and actually yeah. doing forty five minutes or an hour and then just taking an actual break where you actually do nothing yeah. and stop is kind of so much more energizing and so much more Absolutely. like you know you can bring a lot of focus to it. it's kind of like a martial arts sort Absolutely. of. Absolutely, and you've got to remember as well, architects were creating things. Yeah, and if we're there sat at the at our desk and looking out of the window. Mm. How can you say that's not work? You're thinking. And I think the culture is within a lot of practices is that you're actually, if you're sat there having a coffee staring out of the window, that's not work. But that is work because it's art, isn't it? We're creating art and architecture mm. and you've got to you've got to give trust people that that is a good way of running a practice um, and so the you know the practices I th- I see that are much much happier the ones that embrace that mm. that sort of culture they have a different culture, um, you know that 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 would that would be something I personally believe in um, and it really is it, I can see, I can see that it works. It's interesting. I was reading a book uh, recently by Rory Sutherland, who's the oh. vice president of Ogilvy, um, and he was talking about just that exact thing like the one of the most important aspects for creativity is this downtime is yeah. this ability to actually just switch off for a few moments or even for a day yeah. and just not do anything and allow ideas to kind of simmer and and percolate through the mind yeah. and they kind of rather than always trying to force something out that's right well what, what would your advice be to business owners who often find themselves in this kind of uh energy expenditure lifestyle where they feel that they've got to do everything themselves they can't take a break because they've got to put the thing into planning they've got to do this this is something i meet a lot of you know people yeah i I would um obviously um employ someone like me as a consultant to uh (laughs) to take a look at the business but seriously having someone externally come in and look at the culture and sit in the office for a day and see how people operate would be so valuable i think Mm. um it's um You've got to you've got to look at you know are you making profit are you are your staff um, constantly leaving are you switching staff there's, if there's something like that going wrong you really need to take a hard look of how you're doing things and you've got to look at the that culture within the office from on, on every level um, from the top down and you'll often find that the four percent at the top really don't know what's going on in the business but mm. if you ask the staff right at the bottom they'll tell you all the problems in that office because the staff right at the bottom in in any company, they know all of the problems, they get to hear all of the problems, Um, but they'll be very protective of not telling the people at the top. So someone who can come in and and, um, is independent and can talk confidentially to everyone and understand what's going on is such a valuable experience, even if it's just for the day, a day, a couple of days. Um, and yeah, I think you can you can really turn your business around because if you don't have that good office culture, your practice um, is um, going to suffer. What what sorts of thing measures do you, would you suggest for practice owners or directors to take if they sense that they've got a kind of toxic environment? Yeah, there's. Um, I mean, I've I've done this before because I um I actually went to do some uh, teaching in Rome and what I did is um I got the students and the professors 
into a mentoring session mm. and you can do a number of different exercises and what I was t- talking, touching on before about listening, right. being able to listen to each other. And I did an exercise where I read out, um, it's like a fairy tale and it's full of um, um, quite tricky language, but if you're not listening properly um, and I'll read this question then I'll ask them a series of questions and it's incredible the amount of people who make assumptions so what I'm talking about there is if um, you're not able to listen to your staff or you're not able to listen to who's giving you instructions and you, you're really not present, being present and listening, then how can you, um, how can you deliver on, you know, if you, you're talking to a client and you've not understood the brief properly and that is a, that is a real problem to your business you know, and just that these, these are very simple techniques. Um, so I teach someone how to listen, how, um, look at how they work, you know, what's the length of time that they spend in front of the computer? What are they actually doing? You know, are they coming into work and they're either just, you know, flicking in into a screen, out of a screen, or mm. are they actually being free to engage and say, well, today I want to do this, but it, this afternoon or tomorrow I want to do this and being able to have that free open discussion I think is the only way we're going to attract the best people into our into our businesses but it you've got to give it's got to come from the top down whereby the directors have got to really open up and say look talk to their staff understand how they would like to work and hold it I would say hold, like I did in Rome hold a big workshop and get people talking listening what would you say is the thing that gets in the way of people listening? I think it's this um, this um, this authority of kind of top down um, and nervousness of uh, not fully understanding what's happening with fees, for example. Mm. So I think if you're in practice and you're fairly junior, you don't have you don't have an idea of what fee you've got left to spend on the job, and that can cause stress because mm. you don't know. If you're coming into profit and if your director's not telling you how much and not being open about what you're spending, it can cause stress and he's going to stress you out because you you might be overrunning on the fee. Mm. So I think it's about being completely transparent with, um, with people so they fully understand um, how many hours they've got to work on something. Because I, I think there's so many practices out there who don't measure product, pro- productivity. Right. They really don't. And if you're going to measure productivity, you've got to communicate that to all members of staff. And when you, you understand that you've got so many hours to do something, it might be completely wrong and it might, you might have to say, push back and say, look, I can't deliver that in that time. So how many people have them conversations, you know, really mm. with their bosses to say, I need more hours. And then they maybe they made a mistake or they've got to go back to the client and say, look, we can't do it for that fee. And I think, so I think the financial aspect of private practice and architects is, um, is sometimes um, made um, by keeping things hidden. It's, it's really interesting that you say this. Um, the other day uh, I had uh, somebody phone me up and they were telling me about the issues they were having in their practice. And it was clear that something was happening director level. And just the fact that the employee that the team didn't know what was happening was causing such a sort of relationship stress and they felt that it was really unfair they they just didn't know so it kind of leaves the mind active to invent all sorts of stories mistrust um it's it could be very corrosive and also you know, people just feel undervalued and yeah. they're, they're, they're ultimately we end up, end up leaving. But without that kind of sharing from the top of like yeah. what you're dealing with, it can be a sort of pressure cooker, if you like. Absolutely. And, that, and, like you said, and it's interesting that you say that that kind of anxiety is one of the inhibitors to being able to be present yeah. with another person. That's right. And we, f- we forget this. I mean, I know when I'm stressed or whatever it's it is much more you know you've got something just mulling over in your head yeah. and people are like are you listening what's you know what's happening yeah and that that disconnect can really sort of um take relationships into a place which are very unproductive yeah absolutely no 
no, I agree. That's exactly what I've said. Um, you know, I think we've got to rem remind ourselves that we're all human and people are coming to work and they, you don't know what's going on mm. outside of work. And they may, they may have had a bad, they might be in a bad relationship. They may be, um, have gone through some family bereavement. You know, um, you don't know what um, goes on outside of the office. And I think if you have an office where people can talk freely, um, you've got a better chance of getting more, um, dealing with the problem quickly um, and ha having productive staff, which we all want to be productive because fees are so tight. I understand that. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that would be the culture that I would um, put forward to any practice. Um, Creating yeah. that kind of safe space where, yeah. where team members feel like they can open up and, yeah. and share. And if you look at all the big companies now in the world, um, you know, I think it all started probably with Google. Um, um, that is the way most companies are going. And now if you look at modern office design, it's very much like, it's almost like you're at home or it's like a cafe. And mm. that's the sort of culture that people really want to, they don't want to sit at a desk in front of a screen. They want to move to a laptop. They want to work from home more. You know, it's, it's, it's having that freedom and trusting the staff. Um, yeah. So what's next? What's next? Um, well, you, I'm with your mentoring and, and also within within nuclear. Yeah, so I'm I'm currently working on a a new, a new ten year project. Um, so it's an extension to. Um, um, so that's going to keep me going for ten years during um, <laughs> during um, work time, work during working hours, and I think I want to um, keep on with mentoring and finding. I'd like to mentor not just maybe architects, but people within construction because mm. um, I think these principles can apply to uh, other industries and um, so I've only been really doing this mentoring uh, with people for a couple of years and I think um, I'd like to expand to mentor maybe not just younger people maybe people um, who are a similar age to me or even older I don't see the age as a barrier mm. um, so I'd like to grow that side of thing outside of work and do uh, consultancy well, that, that that's interesting what what do you think a lot of sort of more mature architects what are the kind of things that they might be dealing with that would that mentoring would be very powerful for well yeah there might be just like i was saying you know they might have a real problem with um commuting communicating to their younger staff you know and that's and they might be the big problem right they might not be the younger staff you know right from and I've talked to lots of younger people and they obviously have issues with um, the people within their practice um, who are higher up. So it would be great to actually be able to, for me to communicate to them um, the issues that they have mm. where the younger people in the practice always, if it's not that open environment, can't really have that open, honest conversation. So I would always ask very different questions for, for for people maybe at senior level um but still it would have a probably a bigger benefit mm. to to um to architecture and practice and if people want to be mentored by you what's the best way for them to get in touch yeah um you can find me at my mentor dot expert so it's not dot com it's at dot expert right and um yeah you can find all my details i'm on um twitter linkedin um jason boyle um yeah. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.